I uh, do appreciate this opportunity to speak, stand before you this afternoon, and do appreciate Jonathan, his ability to lead singing, my whole family, uh, the congregation here. But as with everything else, I've only got 40 minutes, so I can't take much more time, so we'll get into it. John 12, 48. You will be turning your Bibles to the book of John, and I'm not going to start in verse 48. We'll work our way up to that. If you go back just a few verses prior, I'll go back to verse 37. We find that as Jesus is dealing with some of the people of his day, as he did quite often, he said in verse 37, though it, or it is said of Jesus, though he had done many miracles before them, yet they believed not on him. He had been doing miracles. Many of the Jews rejected those things that he had done, the things he said, he preached, because they did not want a Messiah who was a peaceful Messiah who was going to establish a spiritual kingdom. They wanted a physical kingdom. They wanted a warring, ruling leader. And they didn't find that in Jesus, and they rejected him. It goes on as John is recording in John chapter 12. Verse 38, he talks about the prophet Isaiah, or Isaiah. Said that it might be fulfilled, he spake, Lord, who hath believed our report? And to whom hath the Lord, arm of the Lord been revealed? Who's believed our report? Isaiah knew of rejection of the people of his day. Jesus was facing that same rejection of those who did not believe on him. And it says, therefore they could not believe, because Isaiah said again, he blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts. They should not see with their eyes and understand with their hearts and be converted and I should heal them. He said, these things Isaiah said when he saw the glory and spake of him. If you look in verse 42. It tells us that many of the chief rulers even believed on Jesus. But because of the Pharisees, they wouldn't confess him because they don't want to be kicked out of the synagogue. They love what men said about them more than the praise that God would give them, which is very sad. They wanted a pat on the back rather than a heavenly home. If you go down these next few verses, Jesus cried and said, He that believeth on me, believeth not on me, but him that sent me. He's saying if you believe on me, you're not believing really just on me. You're believing on the Father who sent me here to you. He came as a light of the world. He came for them to believe on him. And notice verse 47. If any man hear my words and believe not, I judge him not. For I came not to judge the world, but to save the world. Some people look at that as a contradiction. It's not a contradiction. What he's saying in verse 47 is, My purpose right now is not to condemn you and judge you to hell. My purpose is to save your soul. Then verse 48. He that rejecteth me, and receiveth not my words, hath one that judgeth him. The words that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. These people, he said, if you'll hear my words and believe them, we're going to look at some other passages that said you'll have eternal life. But verse 47, he's saying, you hear my words and you won't believe them, I'm not going to judge you for that right now. I'm here to save you. But if you do reject me and these commandments, there's one that's going to judge you. And that last phrase is important. The words that I have spoken, the same shall judge you in the last day. That gives us our standard of judgment. And so we're going to be talking not only about this verse, but we'll pull in other verses as well and talk about judgment. But I want to go back and break down verse 48. And then I'll have a general lesson or comments about the judgment day and things about the judgment. That first phrase in verse 48, He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words. Just think of the Jews who heard Jesus on numerous occasions yet still rejected Him and rejected His teaching. Those people rejected Jesus by turning from the commandments He was giving them. He tried to show them what was going to be the church and salvation, what would be their future, and they didn't want that because they had other plans and other things in mind. And they rejected Him. They were, became upset. We've already seen other passages in lessons this weekend as well as you can look at other passages in the life of Christ where they sought to stone him to kill him to put him to death numerous occasions because they didn't want to hear what he had to say I've heard people say well if Jesus came back today the world would accept him no they wouldn't if they wouldn't accept him then what he may, makes you think they would accept him now 
And when you look at the people of Jesus' day, they were far more religious than the heathens that are in this world today. So he'd have fewer followers today, I would say, if he were to come back for another ministry or if he had come in our times. But the Bible tells us that God sent him in the right time, Colossians 4. John 14, 15 says, If you love me, you'll keep my commandments. These people just didn't love Jesus. But they didn't want to keep his commandments. They rejected his commandments. They rejected what he told them to do and the words he preached to them for their salvation. Now think about this in the 21st century. Doesn't this describe the world today? Even more so today. Especially the religious world. You look at the people who claim to believe in Jesus and follow Jesus. And they live like heathens. They talk like devils. They act like the devil. And then they want to talk about, oh, I go to church on Sunday. What good is it doing them when they're living like the world? They're not following the teaching of Jesus no more than the Jews were. People believe, say they believe in Christ today, but they won't follow His commands. You look at some plain, simple commands, the commands of baptism, for instance. Most denominations, I say most, will say, oh yeah, you have to be baptized, but it's not for your salvation. You just have to be baptized because God said so. Why did God say so? To be saved. Jesus even said it and they, they reject Him today. Look at the arguments in Mark 16, 16 that people try to use. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, and he that believeth not shall be damned. And the argument is, well, it doesn't say he that is baptized not shall be damned, so that means baptism is not important. You can't negate the first part of a verse by the second part of a verse, first of all. And secondly, would you follow through with a command to do something that you didn't even believe in? John 3, 18 said, if you believe not, you're condemned already. You think a Jew in that day wanted to be baptized in the water for the remission of sins when it didn't even believe in Jesus as a son of God? I wouldn't even do that if I didn't believe in him. Neither would you. So foolish arguments like that that have been making the circuits for many, many years because these folks don't like what the Bible teaches about baptism. They don't like what Jesus taught about baptism. That's why I said they wouldn't accept him today. They want him to accept his own teaching about baptism. I've even heard people argue, well, I believe the words in red. No, you don't. Don't lie. They want him to follow the words in red, let alone the ones in black. So we see the same thing today in this world that Jesus dealt with when he was here the first time. People don't believe and follow what Jesus said about worship and what the inspired divine writers guided by the Holy Spirit said about worship and the way worship is to be conducted I don't believe that today what, what about wearing the name of Christ people don't believe in wearing the name of Christ they wear whatever sectarian man made name under which uh, the sign under which they walk or around when they enter their building matter of fact you look at the names of churches today how many of them even exalt Christ at all by the name they wear they don't they that exalt a man, themselves, or some community. I'm still amazed at community churches. For the community? Is it the church of the community or the church of Christ? It's a church that belongs to Christ, yet, oh, it's for the community. But they want him to exalt Christ in their name. People continue to reject Jesus, just like they did in the first century. He goes on in verse 48, says, Hath one that judgeth him. His own conscience, first of all, is going to condemn him because the words that have been spoken will be remembered by that condemned person. A guilty conscience doesn't even need an accuser. A person who has a guilty conscience knows that he is wrong, yet some won't even do anything about it. They just stay in that guilt. The words of Christ and the message that he gave while he was here of mercy those sinners rejected and they had to remember those words and sadly those who died lost in the first century all the way through this 21st century and until time ends will still have those guilty consciences and regret especially regret when they draw their last breath 
You go on in this verse as well. He said, The words that I have spoken, the same shall judge them in the last day. The words that Jesus spoke. Well, let's look at some other verses about those words of Jesus. If you go back to John chapter 6, verses 63 through 69, the words of Jesus are the words of life. That's why it's important. That's why the Jews of his day should have listened to him. But they didn't. He gave them the words of life, and they rejected the words of life because it didn't suit their own life. It's the same today, folks. Look back at John 6, verses 63 and following. He says, It is the Spirit that quickeneth. The flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. Jesus tells us that. He has given the words of life. People reject it. But he goes on and says, But there are some of you that believe not, for Jesus knew from the beginning who they were that believed not, and who should betray him. And he said, Therefore I said unto you, that no man can come unto me except it were given unto him by my father, or of my father. From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. And Jesus said unto the twelve, Will you also go away? And Simon Peter answered, said, Lord, to whom shall we go? Notice this next phrase. Thou hast the words of eternal life. Peter recognized it. But not only did he recognize that point, notice the very next phrase. And we believe and are sure that thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. That's what Jesus was preaching that people didn't like. He's preaching that he came to save them. For the Son of Man has come to seek and save that which is lost. Luke 19, 10. And Peter made this confession that we believe and are sure beyond a shadow of a doubt without any question at all that you're the Christ, the Son of God. We need to have that same conviction today. If we truly want the words of life and believe the words of life, then we do believe that Jesus is the Son of God and we'll obey Him and we'll look at some of those passages just in a moment. Matter of fact, look at John 5, 24. We must believe the words of Jesus. If we don't, we stand condemned as those of John 12, 48. In John 5, 24, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that heareth my word and believeth on him, or believeth him that sent me, hath everlasting life. If you believe on the one who sent me, God the Father who sent me down here, you're going to have eternal life. Now, he's not just saying believe on him. That's where the denominational world has another mistake or makes another mistake. Oh, I believe. And that's all I need to do. Belief is all that's necessary for salvation. They totally miss the boat when they understand or when they read this word believe. They don't understand what the word believe in the New Testament even means. It means obedience. In old King James, that ETH ending, it's a continuous action verb. It means you keep on doing this. So when you hear my words and you believe on him who sent me, you'll have everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. Be passed from that spiritual death unto spiritual life and eventually everlasting life. Then notice another passage, John 8, 31. The words of Jesus are important. The words that I've spoken unto you, they're important. And the Jews didn't believe it. They didn't understand it and they didn't obey them. They're important because it shows discipleship. John 8, 31 says, If ye continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed. That helps us understand even John 5, 24, when he said, If you hear and you believe on him that sent me, we believe through that obedience. Continuing in the word. If you continue in my word. Not enough to just say, Well, I believe the Bible. I know people who claim to believe the Bible, but they don't follow it. I know people who claim to believe the whole Bible, yet they'll say, well, you know, God doesn't require me to do this. I've had people say, when I've quoted Bible to them or showed them a passage in the Bible, well, you know, that, that's not that important. God can overlook that. Can we? Absolutely not. What in the Bible can we overlook and go to heaven? Somebody tell me. What can we overlook and go to heaven? Nothing. We have to follow all the New Testament. Now we know there are passages that don't apply. Some of the miraculous things that happened in the first century. 
but there's still the inspired Word of God that we believe and follow and understood those things happen. But we have the Word of God to follow. We can't just pick and choose, oh, well, I like this, I don't like that. Years ago, I heard the story of a person who cut passages out of their Bible because they didn't like those passages. And when it was pointed out, well, this is in the Bible, no, it's not, it's not in my Bible. Well, you can cut it out all you want, but it's still in the inspired Word of God. People can believe it and obey it, or they can reject it and be condemned. I can't control that. We can't put a gun to someone's head and make someone believe. We can't make them obey. They have the Bible, and many of them are rejecting it. Notice now the standard of judgment. The standard of judgment that will be executed will be the word of God. The words that I have spoken, the same, the same words shall judge him the last day. If we're going to be held accountable for something, don't you want to be sure about that standard? If there is an objective standard that we're to follow, spiritualist the Bible, don't we want to know about it? If I'm going to be held accountable to God, don't I want to know my Bible and obey it? Not cherry pick what I like and then throw the rest of it out. But I want us to think about some things here. We're not going to be judged by what we think or how we feel. Not even going to ask the preachers in this audience because you've, especially you older ones, have heard it far more than I have. Oh, I know what I feel in my heart. Or this is what I think about it. I saw a discussion on, I won't call his name, but on someone's Facebook, Facebook post, and I actually made a comment under it yesterday, where someone was talking about some of the situations going on in our country with the gun control and things like that. And this person says, I don't really care about your opinion. I don't care what you think. But that same person wanted to impose her opinion on what she thought. It's the kind of world we live in. They want to tell you what they think about it, and that's their opinion. You better listen to it, but they don't care what the Bible says or what we think. And I've had people say, well, what do you think about it? And I've told them, it doesn't matter what I think about it. It matters what God's Word says about it. And if we go back to the Bible and we find that Bible passage... And I had a person say, no, 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 I, I, I read the Bible. I don't want to know what the Bible says. I can read it. I want to know what you think about it. I quote them the scripture. No, you're quoting the Bible. I know that's what I think about it. <laughs> this person kept arguing. They didn't want to know what the Bible said. It's kind of one of those things if I had hair, I'd have pulled it out, but I don't have it. <laughs> it's like throwing up your hands and what do you do? You can't get through to someone like that. They're, in essence, whether they're admitting it or not, or even flat out denying they don't believe the Bible, they don't believe the Bible. They can deny, oh, I believe God's Word. I, I want to follow God's Word, but I don't know your opinion on this. My opinion doesn't matter. If it doesn't mesh or is not in harmony with God's Word, and if it's in harmony with God's Word, it's not my opinion, it's what God said. Amen. And that's what we need to be doing and following. It's a thus saith the Lord, not a thus saith John, thus saith Harold, or anybody else in this audience or in the world. What God's Word teaches that we're to follow. We're also not going to be judged according to what our parents believed. All oh, some people say, well, mom and daddy did this, and mom and daddy believed that. What was good enough for mom and daddy was good enough for me. Did mom and daddy follow the Bible? As the New Testament tells us to follow that Bible? Or did mom and daddy pick and choose what they wanted? It doesn't matter what mom and daddy believed. Mom and daddy's held accountable for what mom and daddy did. I'll be held accountable for what I do, and you're going to be held accountable for what you do. We can't ride mom and daddy's coattails of heaven. Too many people are riding them to hell, and they don't even realize it. Because they think what mom and daddy said was the gospel. And they put more faith and trust in mom and daddy than they do in Jesus Christ. That's sad. We're also not going to be judged by our, our Christian friends or so-called Christian friends. We're not even going to be judged by our enemies and how they lived and what they did. There is a standard of judgment that we all must face. And that standard is the Word of God 
and how we lived according to it. At the judgment, there's only going to be two groups of people, the righteous and the unrighteous, the saved and the lost. And in which group we will find ourselves will determine how we're following that Bible or whether or not we're following that Bible. Now let's look at some things about the judgment in general. There is going to be a judgment. We know for a fact there's going to be a judgment. The Bible teaches us there's going to be a judgment. As a matter of fact, logic itself tells us there must be a judgment because all of the evil that's in the world, many of which goes unpunished, there has to be a judgment. But I'm concerned with the Scriptures, not just what we say that there's evil in the world and there's going to be a judgment. What does the Scripture say? The Scriptures say it is going to be. Hebrews 9.27 As it is appointed unto men once to die and after this the judgment. 2 Corinthians 5.10 tells us we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Notice we must all appear before the judgment seat and give an account of the things done in this body according to that which we have done whether it be good or bad. Good, bad, right or wrong, we're all going to stand before God. I'm not going to stand with my family. I'm not going to stand with parents, grandparents, anybody else. I'm going to stand by myself in front of God and give an account of how I've lived. And you are too. That's why we need to be ready and must be ready. Titus 2.13 says, Looking for that blessed hope and glorious appearing of the great God, our Savior, Jesus Christ. We're looking forward to that coming. If we're living right and following that word, there will be a judgment. Over and over and over again, the Bible teaches that there will be a judgment day. We sing a song in a songbook, or a lot of songs in a songbook, about the judgment. There is coming a day when we're all going to stand before God and be judged. Well, who's going to be there? Well, I just gave it away, Dub. All of us. 2 Corinthians 5.10 All of us will appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Matthew 16, 27 says, For the Son of Man shall come in His glory of the Father with His angels, and then shall reward every man according to his works. Romans 14, 10 says, But why dost thou judge thy brother? Or why dost thou set it not thy brother? For, all, for we all shall stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Both good and bad. Remember we, we mentioned... 2 Corinthians 5.10 We're going to give an account of what we've done whether it is good or bad. But the good and the bad are going to stand before him. John 5.29 And shall come forth they that have done good unto the resurrection of life and they that have done evil to the resurrection of damnation. I'm not going to take the time because we really don't have the time. But you can turn in your Bibles to Matthew 25 verses 31 through 46. And it talks about those on the left hand and those on the right hand. Those who are going to be saved and those who are going to be lost. These shall go away into everlasting punishment, those on the left hand, but the righteous and life eternal. Matthew 25, 46. There will be some saved, some lost. And that great judgment day will be that day that we'll have to stand before God for that sentence or for that reward. When will judgment be? We hear all the time, I haven't heard as much in recent years, but occasionally you'll still hear some so-called modern-day prophet that predicts the coming of the Lord. In my lifetime, I've heard several of them. And I've studied through history of different religions way back, several hundred years. And even in America, several hundred years. Where people have predicted the coming of the Lord. 1 Thessalonians 5, 2 and 3 says, For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. For when they shall say, Peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them, as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. A thief in the night. 2 Peter 3, 10, he says the same thing. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat, and the earth and the works also that are therein shall be burned up. The day will come as a thief in the night. Judgment day is going to be that way. Does a thief knock on your door? Hey, I'm coming in to rob you. 
They announce their presence. I'm going to rob you. Open your door. They come when you least expect it. That's where the Lord's going to be. As a thief in the night. Matthew 24 verse 36 says, But of that day and hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels in heaven, but my Father only. That day and hour knoweth no man. Yet people will look at that verse and still tell you they can predict the coming of the Lord. I remember this old fellow just a few years ago. He since died. He was making the prediction. He made a prediction, was it three or four years ago, I believe? And then when it didn't come to pass on that day, he came back on and was interviewed and said, Oh, I missed my calculations by one year. It'll be next year. It didn't come then, and then he died shortly thereafter. See, these so-called modern-day prophets, false prophets, can predict all they want. But the Bible tells us, and that's going to be the guide, and that's going to be the standard of judgment. It tells us there's going to be judgment, but we don't know when it's going to be. We just better be ready for it. And if we're not ready, we better be getting ready. Because we're all going to stand before God. Matthew 24, verses 42 through 44. Jesus says, Watch therefore, for ye know not the hour the Lord doth come. But know this, that if the goodman of the house had known in what, what watch the thief would have come, he would have watched and would not have suffered his house to be broken up. Therefore be ye also ready. For in such an hour as ye think not, the Son of Man cometh. When you least expect it and least think it's going to happen, that's when it's going to happen. Some of these more recent events where people have tried to predict, I've had people come up to me and ask them, what do you think about that? You think the Lord's coming that day? Are you scared? Are you worried? No, I'm going to go on like I have every other day. Because He's going to come, but we don't know when it's going to be. And no man can predict it. There will be a judgment. We just don't know when it's going to be. Who's going to be the judge? Who's going to judge us one day? Romans chapter 3 verses 5 and 6 said, But if our righteousness commend the righteousness of God, what shall we say? Is God unrighteous who takes the vengeance? I speak as a man. God forbid. For then how shall God judge the world? Hebrews 12, 23 says, To the general assembly and the church of the firstborn which are written in heaven, and to God the judge of all, and the spirits of just men made perfect. God's going to judge us. But how is He going to judge us? Who is He going to appoint as our judge? God is going to execute that judgment through Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. John 5.22 says, For the Father judgeth no man, but hath committed all judgment unto the Son. The very one who came to save us will be the one who judges us. And rightfully so. You think about what Jesus did in this life. He left heaven, emptied himself of the glory of heaven, took upon himself the form of a man. He became a servant. And because of what he did on this earth, he's become the author of eternal salvation. Hebrews 5, 9 tells us to all them to obey him. But in doing so, in coming and living and having to take the form of man, having to go through the pain and suffering and problems that we all face, we have some that are not here today because of sickness, and sickness has been going around the whole country. Flu has been rampant this year. Numerous people have died of the flu this year. We all get sick. Jesus left all that he had in heaven to come down and experience all the aches and pains that we do, to get sick like we get sick, to feel the heartache, and he did because of the rejection he dealt with, all for us. And because of that, God said he's committed judgment unto the Son. Jesus not only lived and suffered what he did physically prior to the cross, but then you go to the cross. He suffered, bled, and died so that we could live to save us from our sins. 
And because of that, God's committed this judgment to him. Who better to judge the world than the one who died for us and tried to save mankind from their sins? And for those who reject him, he's the one that we're going to be standing in front of. And those who do reject him to hear him say, Depart from me, ye cursed, in everlasting fire. Prepare for the devil and his angels. Those are not the words that we want to hear. But folks, judgment day is coming. And we're going to have to stand before Jesus, the righteous judge. I was reading somewhere and preparing for this lesson that where someone wrote that judgment is going to be across the board, is not going to be any partiality. He's not going to show partiality over the rich or the poor. That a king as well as a slave can be condemned and will be condemned. However, that same king or that same slave could be saved if they obeyed him. And the same with us today. Some people make it through this life with all their money and their wealth and riches and power and fame and whatever else they may have. They think they make it through this life and everything's wonderful because they've got things here in this life. They may be rich according to this world, but if they don't have Jesus Christ, they're poor. And we have to be ready in our lives for that judgment because of those things and understanding what God's Word tells us. That judgment day is coming. Acts 17, 30 and 31 says, At the time of this ignorance God winked at, but now commands all men everywhere to repent. Because He has appointed a day in which He will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom He hath ordained, whereof He has given assurance unto all men and that he had raised him from the dead. Notice he, in times past, winked at some ignorance. But Paul is telling these people at Mars Hill, there are, there are no more excuses for you. God commands all men everywhere to repent. Change your life. Obey God. Here's why. Because he's appointed a day that he's going to judge the world. Notice it said, in Righteousness. You ever watch these movies where you see the old corrupt judge? And it's not just in movies, folks, it's in real life. You have the old corrupt judge that because a certain party comes in front of him, maybe one of his buddies, hunting buddy, fishing buddy, some well-known person in town, and he lets him off of what he's done. He wasn't impartial, he was partial to a person. In our court systems today, we are told that there should be impartial juries impartial judges but that doesn't always happen but we're going to stand before the great judge who is impartial doesn't matter who you are how much money you've had where you've been how good you look how much fame fortune or power you have it's going to be one standard the Bible I deal with people in my profession as a law enforcement officer and one thing they were pounding in everyone's head in our academy that I have heard over and over again since I've been on the streets is that when you go to a situation, you have to be impartial. You have to hear both sides of the story. Then you have to make a judgment call on who's right and who's wrong. Most of the time there's enough evidence to determine it. There's sometimes not. But you have to make a call to be impartial. And I've tried to follow that not just because I heard that then, but because what this says. We live our lives in service to God, following His Word, and we may have family members or friends who are living faithfully. We continue to encourage them and enjoy the fellowship with them, but we may have the same who are not. And how many preachers have gone into false doctrine? Because a son or a daughter, a wife, a friend, parents, grandchildren, or some other family member. Because they try to seek ways to justify the sinful actions rather than tell them, you are in sin. You need to get out of it. Because that's what God's going to do through His Son, Jesus Christ, one day. 
Those people who are living in sin won't have a justification. Well, Daddy said I was all right. They're going to answer to the great judge who is impartial in all of his judgment. Romans 2.16 tells us that that standard of judgment is going to be the Bible we already read in John 12.48. In the day which God would judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel, Paul is writing. According to the gospel, the Bible will stand before God. This word will be open. And we're going to be judged by how we live. As a matter of fact, we'll close with this particular verse. Revelation 20 and verse 12. And I saw the dead, small and great, appear or stand before God. The books were open and another book was open, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. He's going to open this Bible up and he's going to look at it with us and he's going to judge us by that standard and look at our works to see if our works we're in harmony with the standard of God's word. And if they were, he'll say, well done, good and faithful servant. If they weren't, he's going to say, depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I never knew you. What will we hear that day? What are we going to do in our lives to prepare for that day? I hope that we all are preparing and are prepared in our current state. That if the Lord came back before this service ended, that we would all hear him say, well done. If not, you need to make changes in your life. And you need to do so and serve God faithfully. Judgment day is coming. We do have a standard. And we must meet that standard and obey it and follow it so that heaven can be our home when this life is over. Thank you for your attention.